Welcome everyone to the seminar. This is actually great to see a lot of people turning out for the first uh, first seminar of the year. And uh, so uh, I suppose all of you know me, but just as a bit of introduction. So I'm Aditya Bhaskara. I'm a faculty and I will be uh, running the seminar this semester. And uh, given the or given that everything is online, we've been able to like invite a bunch of uh, people from various places and uh, from ex external speakers, that is. And uh, we've tried to focus on people who are kind of uh, junior in their career. So we've tried to get uh, senior PhD students and postdocs. Okay, for students, you might think that's not junior in the career, but <laughs> from a global point of view, that is uh, junior. So. Uh, so yeah, so that's the focus of the seminar. So, and uh, for students, hopefully you'll get a chance to see how other people present their work. And uh, that can also like help you in terms of like preparation for talks and stuff like that. Okay. So, uh, so I've, uh, yeah, I can see like a few people I've invited from EC also showed up. So yeah, if you can spread it to students in other departments, that's also a great thing. Okay, so, so with that uh, very quick uh, introduction. So yeah, there's another short thing that I have to say, which is that some of you maybe actually signed up for the seminar for like one credit or two, uh, one credit, I think. And uh, so I've enabled a, a, a Canvas site for this, uh, for this, uh, for, for the seminar. Uh, so th there are no real requirements in terms of uh, what you have to do apart from from showing up. And uh, so if you've actually signed up for one credit, then I encourage that uh, I will nag you about this towards the end of the semester. But towards the end of the semester, I'd like to I'd like you to think about what you've seen and maybe pick your top one or two uh, of the talks that you've seen. I mean, one is fine. And uh, write about half a page to a page of a note about why you thought, why you found that interesting. Okay, so uh, you can pick more than one if you really like multiple of them. Uh, so this is like this, the, the only kind of a short exercise that you need to do if you are signed up for credit for this seminar. Okay, and, uh, and you can submit this towards the end of the semester. As I said, I will kind of start nagging you in April and uh, that should be good, okay. So, so yeah, so, so today as the first session I thought that it's nice not to have an external speaker, but to instead kind of showcase our own grad students and their work. So I've tried to get like people from different groups and uh, not sure uh, if we finalized on the order. So we will go, I guess, by the order in which students are ready. So, uh, uh, so the speakers are uh, Vivek, Pega, Archit, and uh, uh, Brian and one more student, Vinu. I, I don't know if he's still if he's already here. So yeah. uh, and Vinu Joseph. Yeah. So I think <coughs> we have like five talks. So so yeah. So we can uh, start. Uh, yeah. I have an announcement. Aditya, for the mailing list, I think if you want to tell like next time, if you don't yes. want to send email. So uh, if you uh, if you haven't registered, like I put a, a mailing list thing. You just need to fill your name. And I think that would be good enough. Email ID and name, uh, that would be good good enough for like, so because we will be sending email uh, next time on this instead of the grads at CS. So uh, if you haven't signed up, you can just sign up on this. Just one. Right, so the grads, I just put it for the first uh, seminar. I don't intend to spam it uh, after this. So uh, so yeah, please sign up for the, yeah. and for the mailing list. This is the email ID from which mail will come. Uh, at that also. Cool. Anyway. Uh. Okay, so uh, so we can get started. So how about uh, so who wants to start? Uh, Vivek, do you want to go in the order in which you sent in your email? Maybe so. So the way this will work is that uh, I've just enabled screen share for everyone, so you can uh, so. So students can go in some order. They can just kind of very briefly introduce themselves and talk about some of their research. So, and for the other students, you should uh, ask questions either by raising your hand or you can type them in the chat. It's probably better to raise your hand so that 
maybe one of us will interrupt the student somewhere towards the end or at some logical point if they actually have a break okay so does that make sense okay so uh, and, and a quick reminder that raising your hand has been moved to the reactions button in zoom recently so if you can't find it in the participant pane click reactions yes this has yeah. been a problem in my class too so yeah it doesn't have actually at least for me it's showing thumbs up and clap only but any <laughs> which means that raise hand is not enabled and the host needs to fix it no 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 oh. i can raise I, I can raise hand yes sir i mean what's oh, it's you because you're the host uh, oh i am a co-host oh okay uh, maybe i'm the host that's why i cannot raise hand okay achit is able to raise yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah if yeah. i go into participants there's like a triple dot at the bottom and if you click on it you can raise and lower hand there it depends on, on which version of zoom you have and whether yeah. it's a linux version or Uh, okay. Also, there was yeah. a recent update which moved the raise hand to the reactions button. So I think it's not updated for whoever is not seeing in the reactions. I see. Yeah, I maybe mean, chat I'm... chat would be good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will figure this out anyway. Uh, so I think we can go in order if uh, people are okay with it. Uh, so I think Arjit, you can yeah. go first. All right. Uh, can you guys see the slides? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So maybe I'll give you a very short introduction, Achit. Mm -hmm. He's uh, maybe a fourth year, a yes. fourth year student now, and uh, he's been uh, working with uh, Bay Wong, and he's going to talk about uh, some cool stuff he's been doing about uh, like topological analysis of uh, activations in deep learning. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first data seminar of the semester. Today, I'm going to be talking about our work in which we explore the shape of uh, activations in deep learning. Uh, I'll specifically be talking about our experiments on the BERT transformer for NLP. Uh, this work is done by me and Nitin and Saurabh, uh, who are also students of Bay, and Nitin and me uh contributed equally to this work um you can i i'm not sure if the slides are going to be uploaded to the data science website but if they are you can check out the uh, corresponding paper at the link here and the demo and the source code is also available openly so the motivation of this project comes from trying to figure out what the activation vectors of these high dimensional uh, these high dimensional activation vectors from neural networks look like so if if you on the right you see a u map projection of the activation vectors from inception v1 which is a very popular um, image classification network and there seems to be some structure there but it's not very clear what this structure is uh, especially in the lower levels where the separation between classes is not that evident um, just doing a uh, dimensionality reduction uh, alone on itself does not lend to a good understanding of the activation vector space. So what we want to do with this project is to understand what the organizational principle is, if there is any, and to analyze the space of these activation vectors. So the key idea here is comes from uh, topological data analysis and in a method called mapper graphs. So what we do is we treat the neuron activations as point clouds in high dimensional space. Um, and for this project, we've created some interactive visualization and exploration tools that can help the end user discover uh, branches and loops. And I'll, I'll shortly go over later what these branches and loops mean in the context of the activation space. So, okay, so what is the mapper algorithm? So we have our activation point cloud, which is, let's call it X, which is a, a point set in the D-dimensional space. And what we do is we we create a function, a filter, we choose a filter, filter function F, which basically maps this 
high dimensional data set to either a scalar or a smaller dimensional uh, space. It can be R, R2, uh, or R3. The algorithm works with in the general case, but we mainly concern ourselves with one or two dimensional filter functions F. Uh, the next step is to create uh, something called a cover of F. So if it's if if my filter function is one dimensional, which means it lies on a line, my cover would be a set of overlapping intervals. And then what we do is we take each of this interval and look at the points corresponding to uh, the interval in the higher dimensional space and cluster them, and then join each pair of vertices whose corresponding cover sets have non-empty intersections. So here's a picture to help. The on the leftmost side, uh, can you can you see my mouse pointer here? No. Oh no worries. Okay, so on the left hand uh, side we I have. Can. Sorry. Oh okay. We can see that. Yes, we can see. All right. So this is my let's say high dimensional point cloud X. Here it's just two dimensional, and my filter function here is just the y coordinate of each point. I map that to my uh, one dimensional uh, like R1 line. And then I divide this line into overlapping intervals such that all of the F of X is covered by these intervals. And if you see here, there's certain amount of overlap, which is a hyperparameter of the method. And then what you do is you take each interval, see what all points lie in this interval and cluster them. So for U1, there will be just one cluster because this is just one contiguous point sample. For U2, uh, you'll have these and these points. So you'll get two clusters. And then again, for U3, you'll have a single cluster. And that basically gives you a graphical representation of the shape of your data. There are uh, concerns about the choice of the filter function uh, and the clustering method. In general, the clustering method, you want to be it to be parameter free. You do not want to specify your uh, K beforehand. So DB scan or other uh, related uh, clustering algorithms work well for these this algorithm. And uh, the number of intervals and the uh, pa overlap parameter is something that you can uh, tune or grid search, but there's like no proper method to evaluate those. So something that looks reasonable is usually used, but there's still ongoing work about the uh, stability of and the parameter tuning for these parameters. Okay, so moving on, the 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 take home message for this uh, uh, tool, which we call TopoAct, is to use this mapper algorithm to um, capture some topological structures, uh, specifically branch such as these and loops such as these uh, in the space of activation vectors. And they may or may not be always visible when using classing, classic dimensionality reduction. Um, this method is basically a new way of understanding how the network sees these whole point clouds as a single entity rather than inspecting each of the individual activation vectors. Uh, we are looking at how the entire space of activation vectors is laid out in with respect to the trained neural network. And hopefully this would provide another uh, cure in the uh, toolbox for neural network analysis. Okay, so for text classifiers, and specifically BERT, what we do is we have a, a, a data set of input sentences. For this work, we use the universal dependencies uh, data set uh, and the English corpus from that. So you have your each uh, input word. Uh, you pass it through your uh, BERT network and get each word's activation vector rather than the sentence activation. And then you take those activation vectors from a particular layer, and then you create the mapper graph as a topological summary, and then TopoAct uh, loads that data up into an interactive visual tool where you can 
click on nodes and inspect each node uh, what kind of words are there what are the part of speech tags in a particular word and so on and so forth so yeah as i said uh, there there's about 5000 uh, sentences in our the data set that we uh, chose to explore and uh, what we found is that with the help of this tool we were able to look uh, reveal some syntactic and semantic uh, regularities in various layers of bird and there were also differences in how the network sees the activations in a semantic sense uh, across layers so this this can be used as a tool for hypothesis generation in NLP. So this is what the tool looks like. Um, up here, you have the option to select the layer that you want to visualize. Um, you can choose between using Euclidean or cosine distance between the vectors and the 80 is the number of intervals and the 30 is the percent of overlap, which you can choose between some pre-computed uh, values um, the Jacquard similarity threshold allows you to clean up uh, edges in the graph uh, where the adjacent clusters do not have very strong overlap. So that allows some sort of like cleanup. And if you click on a node on the right hand side, you can see the composition of that node and the uh, distribution of uh, part of speech tags there. So I'll just go over a few um, examples quickly of what uh interesting things we found when we ran uh to proact on these bird embeddings uh the first one that we found was uh that uh, bird is able to do pronoun differentiation um so we looked at embeddings for the word me and my so at this node a it seems it, it there are like mixture of uh me and my pronouns uh, and then it branches into uh, both the singular personal pronoun me in the upper branch and the possessive form my in the lower branch. Um, also, one interesting thing was uh, in this sentence here in B, she trusts me, she's more, oh no, that's not the one. Yeah, so yeah, the, the interesting example is down here. So there was this example where there's either a typo or a local dialect where it said I was riding on me bike and I thought I'd swallow an insect. However, here the word me is grammatically used as my, right? Uh, but again, bird is able to distinguish those and that that's what we reinforce via uh, examining these embeddings through this uh, graphical representation. Um, another one is that bird is able to do contextual differentiation in a semantic sense as well. So in this uh, specific branch of the network, we found that bird is able to separate out the uh, use of sea or water related words uh, in, so this branch mostly concerns itself with the word sea, waves, marine, whereas the branch E and D are more uh, related with culinary usage, well, such as like water, oil, rain, um, and so on and so forth. So that was another interesting uh, uh, usage of, uh, of trying to see these activation vectors as graph rather than just point clouds laid out in two dimensional space. Um, another example was differentiation between uh, photography, art, and associated words. See, Again, Achit, uh, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt, but uh, we're almost out of time. So do you yeah. want to like wrap up quickly? Yeah, I think this is the second to last or so slide. Okay. I'm not, I'm not yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So again, so photographs are like the art in general lies in a separate branch and then it branches out into specifications or specializations of this uh, word meaning. There's also a difference. Uh, there's also, we could also discover uh, differences between local and global syntax, uh, where we found that different branches correspond to like different uh, expressions of goodness or size. Um, sure. So yeah, I, I, since uh, we're running out of time, I'll just uh, wrap up. So again, 
with by applying to proact to BERT, we were able to discover uh, some linguistic structures using a human in the loop approach. Of course, it would be great to do this in a completely automated way, but we are not there yet. And that would be something that would be quite interesting. Um, the code and demo, again, is open source and available at the links. Um, again, one important thing to underline here is since there's a human in the loop, uh, there's the possibility of confirmation bias in our observation because we might want, we might have dug into what we want to see. So that is something that I want to underline. And again, that is something that might be addressed via automated uh, ways of generating these insights. Um, and, and then again, this is a very general uh, method which can be uh, applicable to other neural network architecture and other data sets. Um, and yeah, then again, there's issues of parameter tuning and scalability, uh, but that uh, I'll, I'll just wrap up my talk uh, here if, and take any questions if there are any. Yeah, we can like quickly take one question. Thanks for the talk, Achyad, this is nice. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a question, we can do it while uh, I think Vino is next, so while he sets up. Oh no, sorry, Benway is next. Yeah, Benway, hopefully he's around. So uh, meanwhile, if you have questions to uh, Archit, yeah, you can go ahead, otherwise. So I have a very basic question, Archit. Uh, why do you think like this way of topological analysis is better than the normal visualization which we do by just clustering the higher dimension or the lower dimension? In this right. way, why do you think like topological structure is important? Like, what is a one sentence idea or the key behind? Yeah, it? yeah. So the, one of the biggest advantages that I see of uh, using this kind of topological analysis and specifically Mapper is that it makes explicit these edges between cluster, and then you can do a lot of graph-based uh, applications. You can find paths between classes, which is not so easily evident in other either dimensionality reduction methods or even in the higher dimensional space. Uh, you could do some like geodesic based methods, but I think the explicit representation of clusters and edges between them is a nice way of uh, formulating other uh, points and you can jump off to other methods uh, using these representations. Okay, thanks. Uh... Right, so we can uh, we can go to Benway. We we can also have a towards the end. We can have like a general Q and A for everybody. Uh, but in the interest of time, let's move to Benway talk. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so this is uh, Benway, and uh, he works with uh, Jeff. I think he's also he's now a third or fourth year student, third year student. And uh, yeah, so he's going to talk yeah. about. Uh, some special variant of sketches. So I'm not sure what he's going to talk about, but I'm curious to see. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. This is Ben Wei. And uh, the, this work uh, is done by three students, Ben Wei, uh, Zhuo Yue, uh, Yan Qing. And they, uh, we are uh, students of uh, Professor Fifi Li and uh, Professor Jeff Phillips. Uh, and then this, this paper has been accepted uh, by Sigmoda 2021 and uh, will be published in June, this June. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, uh, so the, the, the sketch, uh, the given data will be a stream. Uh, and uh, oh, each item will be only show once, and uh, and uh, uh, the stream we say the stream is too big to fit in memory. Uh, okay, then uh, for many questions uh, we already have some uh, streaming algorithm which you can maintain a sketch of the of the st uh, stream data, uh, so that uh, at the end of the stream we can we will be able to answer some statistical questions for the for the stream data. 
And, and in this paper, we, pre, uh, inter, we want to introduce uh, two more powerful uh, sketching, sketch model. The first one is uh, at the time persistent sketch, uh, ATTP in short. Uh, and this model uh, after build, uh, is still small and uh, uh, will able to fit in memory. After the build, uh, it, it will be able to answer uh, any historical version of A, which is uh, from the beginning to the time step T for, for any T less uh, earlier than the current uh, time step. Um, this is uh, uh, this is uh, powerful because uh, say uh, say you can I a, a simple example of, of a streaming data will be uh, that, that all the IP address visiting your server. So uh, when your server uh, crashed, uh, you will. Uh, you will want to figure out uh, which IP address visited your your server most and uh, uh, actually caused the, the server crashing. So, so you, you and uh, you also want to know what it happened. So you will uh, file some query of the IP visiting uh, frequency. Uh, uh, for 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 the the historical version of of a like a, uh, like a, at a, at a, at the beginning uh, at the first day or second day uh, what 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 happened to to the server okay. um, and uh, another uh, Persistent sketch is uh, uh, we want to introduce is back in time uh, or BITP sketch. Uh, and it, this one is similar to ATTP, but uh, uh, focus on the, the most recent uh, subset of, of the stream. So uh, it, most recent T item. So uh, I will say this is more powerful, well, more important because uh, for most uh, problem, uh, the recent information is more important than uh, older one. And then there is a more uh, general position sketch uh, like uh, uh, we'll be able to answer, we'll be able to provide a sketch for, for any, times step S to any time step T, uh, but it's, it is much harder and, uh, and out of our, uh, it's beyond of our paper, out of this discussion. Okay, uh, yeah. So I, I will give a, 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 a simple example and, and uh, a toy uh, data set. Okay. Uh, the, this uh, stream stream data this stream data is uh, contain only sixteen items. Like the first one is two, and the second one is zero, and so on. Uh, uh, so I said first there will be uh, a streaming uh, algorithm which can can maintain the uh, the the sketch for the most current version, right? and uh, the, the example streaming uh, uh, sketching algorithm is will is the uh, reservoir sampling, okay, the, which you can uh, maintain a a uniform sample of the of a stream. Okay, so for the first one, we will, we we can just keep it. Uh, keep it two, the first one. Okay. Then for the for the second one, we will keep keep it uh, with the probability uh, uh, one over over two. Okay. 
uh, and we are uh, we are like uh, we are lucky this time. So so we keep uh, keep the second uh, item and uh, replaced the the older one. And for for all the for all the uh, following item, we will keep it with probability uh, one over i for each each i's item, and, and then finally it will give us uh, one uniform random sample of the stream. Uh, to make this algorithm. Uh, uh, to make this sketch uh, uh, ATTP sketch, sketch well, we can uh, we can change the, the algorithm slightly change the algorithm. Instead of uh, replace the old item, we will we will keep we will we will not replace the old item, but uh, uh, re uh, but uh, but keep it uh, its time step stamp as well. Okay, so so for the second item, uh, we still uh, we still will keep it with probability uh, one over two, uh, and uh, but we we will keep the the older item as well, and uh, with. The old item has time step one, and the, the new item zero has time step two. And uh, for the second, uh, for the third one, we will not keep it because because we are not like, uh, and the probability is small. Okay, so uh, it turns out uh, the extra time step information is is sufficient to reconstruct uh, the reconstruct a, a sketch for any uh, t uh, for any historical version of, of the stream from the beginning to uh, to any t and uh, Hey, Benway, uh, again, uh, could you wrap up okay. in like a minute or so, just in the interest of time? Oh, okay. So, thank you. Uh, and uh, this uh, random sampling uh, is, is already be able to solve uh, many questions like uh, epsilon quantile, epsilon frequent estimation, and, uh, and uh, others. And, uh, oh, Previous uh, literature, we know that these streaming algorithm ha has this, this these uh, size bound, uh, and uh, after uh, and the uh, uh, ATTP version of them only need a extra log n uh, factor, so it's still reasonable small. Um, the, the, in this page pe uh, paper, we also studied uh, other other uh, sketching uh, technique, and uh, uh, no, I, I will not go uh, go through all of them. Uh, um, we also did some experiments uh, like for for some uh, IP address data set. Okay, the, the random sampling algorithm uh, did, is, uh, did very well. And, uh, and uh, uh, Mesh Gree, chain Mesh Gree, ATTP version of Mesh Gree algorithm uh, uh, is doing um, even, even better. And uh, this, this PCM, a counter main, persistent counter main is our baseline uh, proposed by uh, another paper. Okay. Uh, and uh, our algorithm is doing much better than the baseline. And uh, in, in, in each, in precision and uh, recall as well. And uh, the BITP, 
uh, random sampling is uh, is still reasonable good, but uh, uh, Mr. Gray is is uh, is much harder to uh, to do for a BITP sketch. Okay, and that that's all. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. This is a nice twist on the standard sketches. Very nice to see. So, any questions uh, while I think Vinu sets up? So uh, maybe we can ask one at, towards the end. I can ask one towards the end. I have one, but uh, I don't want to interrupt the time. So maybe okay. Can you? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the next speaker is uh, Vinu Joseph. He is a Ganesha's student, and uh, I've been working a little bit with him. And uh, so he's been doing some work on neural net compression, and I think uh, it's a somewhat of broadish interest. So uh, it's, uh, good to see the talk. And Vinu, try to aim for like seven to eight minutes, if possible. Uh, yeah, that way it'll go up to 10. Okay. Yeah, I will have it. Are you able to see the screen? The, the one with the presentation? Yes. Hey, uh, hey all, uh, my name is Vinu, and uh, my research interest is in, uh, in the intersection of machine learning systems. Prior to grad school, I was at ARM building NVIDIA CPUs, and uh, my uh, advisors are Aditya Bhaskara, Vivek, uh, Mary Hall, uh, Ganesh, and uh, Michael Gallup. And my thesis is, uh, is on uh, uh, you know, systems and methods for resource efficient and reliable deep net. Uh, just to motivate this talk, um, the trend in which the sizes of deep nets have been growing, it shows like only a handful of folks can really afford to train uh, deep nets that would be really useful. And, um, and the rest of us uh, who can't afford, um, uh, we will be compressing these to, to, to you know, particular tasks. We we'll try to fit it into a particular hardware, um, uh, which is which is having certain certain resource constraints, and right. And during this process of of uh, compressing, uh, there there could be side effects like reliability or or fairness, etc. So these are the main reasons uh, for my motivation for my thesis: so compression for efficiency and practical usage. And it's and how do we deal with its side effects? And uh, these device constraints that uh, I'm talking about, that I will talk about, will, will be something very practical. Right? How do you uh, send a model if there's a strict limit on on the on total memory consumed by the model, or if there is a strict limit on how much uh, how much uh, power consumption, how much compute resource it can use. So. This is what we call as either memory constraints or you know, compute constraints. And these, this, these are the kind of objectives uh, like uh, um, uh, of the optimization. And of course, um, you know, the other variability is, you know, some, some networks are over parameterized by design and there are different kinds of architectures, right? Like for language models or image, etc. So yeah, how do we kind of navigate this space? And uh, the the variability uh, it, one once one one end is the networks and then the other end is the hardware right there are different kinds of hardwares some accelerate you know some are gem based hardwares that, that are that specialize in accelerating matrix matrix multiplications and there are other like non gem based hardwares that that, that activate like that they accelerate sparsity uh, sparse computations right so how can we build uh, one system which can deal with uh, this this variability 
we have to abstract this from uh, from from a user trying to compress a neural network into his device. Um, so a general definition of model compression is trying to make it smaller, and we want to maintain the same accuracy. And uh, it works because DNNs are overparameterized by design, and there are several ways to compress. It's not just that there's no one single bullet. There are several ways to compress like pruning, quantization, or factorization. Pruning is simply re identifying redundant components of the network and then and zeroing them out. And uh, if you're familiar with deep nets, the, there's a hierarchy. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a synapse. Synapse form neurons. Neurons form filters, channels. So there, there are, there's a certain structure in the neural network, and you can decide to zero out structures, or, or you know, you can impose no, no structures, for example. And uh, the other alternate to compression is um, changing the numeric format of the remaining weights, right? You still drop saving memory in that case. So, so you, you, you can already see uh, the different kind of um, uh, the, the axes of space that we have to navigate, right? Um, there are different op optimization objectives, like power, memory, uh, runtime, et cetera, and there are different tar target hardware that we need to do inference on, and there are different kinds of architectures, right? So when we started, the, when we started this project, we, we didn't have a single way where a user can simply express these in a standard in a standard system and then express these constraints and then obtain the compressed model easily. So that was the first project. And uh, we realized that, uh, that um, the compression is also set up as an optimization problem. So we had to figure out its uh, hyperparameters. And then um, that, that was an extensive optimization. So we proposed like sample efficient uh, methods for figuring out these hyperparameters. And then when this up when the compressed model is obtained and top one accuracy is maintained, you still have side effects um, like fairness or reliability or explain a change of explainability or change of labels, or you know, the distribution of work less accuracy might change. How do we deal with these side effects? These are the shortcomings. And these are the kind of main problems that we that we have been looking at the last few years. And uh, the solutions that we have proposed is, first of all, uh, we built a programming system for neural network compression called Condensa. Uh, you can programmatically express all your constraints, your target hardware constraints, your express your DNN, and you, and you, when, when you um, when optimization is set up, uh, it would give you a compressed model that satisfies your constraints. And um, in the second project, we worked on uh, automating these auto automating these hyperparameter uh, values, figuring out. And then in the last project, we are looking at um, Lot of this, uh, how do we come up with these uh, like correctness extensions to these optimizations? Right, what is the guarantee that the compressed model is, is correct in in several metrics? Right, so a, a very high level view of of my own thesis is it, it you can think of it as a compiler that takes a pre trained model uh, heavily over, over parameters and, and produces compressed model by minimizing side effects. Right. Uh, uh, for details of the of the of the programming system and the details of the optimization and and the, and the components and the usage, um, I, will, I will not go into the details of it. But a very high level view is in this. Yeah, lock again, uh, we know you have only a minute or so. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll point you to the talk that uh, you can watch online for all the details. And uh, the code and documentation are available, and uh, the, the, the 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 kind of results you can expect is you know, after model compression, you will see a huge reduction in memory and uh, in, in, an improvement in throughput. Like how much uh, in how many frames per second can you do after compression? Uh, there is a correctness angle. I'll go very very fast. Um, it's just that after compression, there's no guarantee that you. For every image that you pass through the compressed network, you're going to get the same label. That guarantee does not exist. Uh, even though top one accuracy might be the same, there's no guarantee that every image is going to be classified the same way. This is critical if you're deploying the compressed model in mission critical applications like, um, like uh, healthcare, for example. So we have been developing systems to and methods to, we've been extending the condenser system to to with correctness, uh, correctness metrics and then usage can the user can uh, uh, yeah right now there is no user interface for correctness metrics but uh, we have methods to figure out uh, to we have methods to minimize this impact of image level 
changes after image level labeling, changes after compression. I'll skip the details. Uh, you can refer the archive paper for this. But again, what we are showing is we are able to successfully minimize the image level impact using using our correctness measurements, and that is also stable. The results are all more in the paper. The last thing we are looking at is um, the distribution of per class accuracy before compression. Uh, the hope is after compression you maintain that distribution, right? We are not in inducing any more unfairness than what or how how much our unfair the parent network was. So we are trying to minimize these distribution changes. That is our current uh, current work, and this is uh, like a summary of all our projects. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out. To us. Yeah, uh, again, sorry to be the adversary and interrupt oh. you, but uh, but this is a good presentation. I must say your slides are pretty ambitious <laughs> given <Yeah>. the time, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I'm glad you finished on time though. Yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, any questions while uh, the next speaker, who is Brian, sets up? Uh, I have a question. So, uh, so I, I guess like you are building a framework where everything is there. Like what you did, you also analyze like one thing which you analyze is like how does the each input label is predict uh, preserve or not, and how the distribution changes. But how do you specify other factors which are there? Because there are lots of metrics around like F one. Uh, there's confusion metric, there is non decomposable losses also. Like, how do you say that all losses are somewhat preserved? Or is like user can specify something which they want to preserve at individual level and then you can optimize for that using this. Yeah, that's, that's the goal. That's the, that's the end goal. So, we okay. have down this in the four layers of abstraction um, uh, preservation at the output space, you know, the yeah. inside, preservation at the memory space where the, the for last one layer, embedding is preserved, or cross layer preservation where attributions are preserved, okay. or you know, uh, you know, how do you deal with you know the decision boundary changes at, at the input space? At the yeah, you want to preserve functional, functional usage of models. So, yeah, we are working our way from output to input. Interesting. Okay. So uh, the next speaker is uh, is Brian. So mm -hmm. if we know stop share, then we can see. Ah, okay. Yeah. So he's going to. He's a student of uh, Blair's, yep. and uh, he has an interesting title. So uh, curious to hear what he has to say. Cool. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about rounding out structural rounding. I can't take credit for the for the title. Um, Addy and Dr. Sullivan came up with it. Um, but I am shamelessly borrowing it. Um, roughly uh, what uh, we're hoping to achieve is we want to solve uh, sort of NP-hard optimization problems uh, on real world networks. So think like um, vertex cover, independent set, dominating set. Um, you know, on real world networks, sort of lots of applications, um, infrastructure, uh, social networks, uh, metagenomics applications. Um, and this seems like really natural because real world networks tend uh, to sort of exhibit uh, lots of sparsity. Uh, and there are um, tons and tons and tons of algorithms uh, that have been designed uh, you know, for decades uh, that take advantage of this sparsity and give us really nice uh, sort of approximation guarantees, uh, if not exact. Um, unfortunately, um, due to possibly a number of causes, maybe inherent noise, bad luck, uh, et cetera. Um, real world networks don't often have exactly, uh, you know, the sort of rigid uh, structural property that you need uh, to, to run, you know, any algorithm that you like. Uh, so, so, you know, possibly, you know, you're close to planar or close to having bounded tree width, but the reality is that your tree width is quite large uh, and that and that you're not planar, um, and so our goal, uh, and the goal of structural rounding is to sort of bridge the gap um, between uh, or that exists here, so that we can use uh, our real world algorithms. Sorry, our our uh, our efficient algorithms on real world networks, uh, sort of without sacrificing, um, you know, our performance uh, and our approximation guarantees. 
Uh, and the, the key observation is that even though real world networks don't have exactly the right sparse structure, they do come quite close. And so uh, a structural rounding algorithm works in three steps. So we start with our initial graph G, and let's say we want to solve uh, vertex cover. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, edit our graph to have uh, some nice property. So in this case, uh, I've edited the graph uh, to be a tree, right? Because uh, now that it's a tree, in the second step, uh, I can use a really efficient dynamic programming algorithm uh, to uh, solve vertex cover uh, on, on sort of my edited graph. Um, the problem is, is that this is only a partial solution, and I don't want to completely forget about the vertices that I deleted. Uh, and so I need to reintroduce them back into the graph and, uh, and then somehow sort of include them into the solution. And depending on the problem, there are lots of different ways to do this. For vertex cover, um, I'm just going to go ahead and add everything that I deleted in the editing step. I'm going to go ahead and add all of them back into the partial solution. For independent set, I would do exactly the opposite. I would just sort of leave them all out, even if I could uh, possibly add one or two. Uh, and when you put this all together, uh, you get this lovely theorem, uh, which you can mostly ignore, because basically what it says is that uh, structural rounding works. Uh, and in particular, um, what structural rounding does is it adds like a plus epsilon uh, factor to your approximation ratio for graphs which are like f of epsilon close, uh, again, measured by the number of deletions uh, to some sort of nice structural class. So uh, we implemented uh, it, an entire structural rounding pipeline to solve vertex cover uh, in nearby partite graphs. Uh, and, so, and so we have two plots here. The one on the right is a little bit more interesting. And so the blue dots are structural rounding, and the red dots are sort of other sort of standard two approximations. Uh, and, and what we can see is that um, structural rounding, it, it just it works better, uh, particularly when the, when the edit set size is quite small. Uh, you know, sort of under under 0.2, but uh, all the way up to 0.4, and this is this is a percentage of, um, or the, this is a ratio of relative to the to the size of the graph. Um, so when our edit set size is 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 only about is up to about 20 percent, our graph structure rounding works really well. Um, the problem, of course, that you can kind of see here is that there's a very strong linear relationship between um, the size of our edit set. Uh, and the quality of our solution. Um, and so it's really important to find really high quality edit sets uh, in order for structural rounding to work well. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that uh, a lot of editing problems are really poorly studied. Uh, odd cycle transversal, which is exactly minimum vertex deletion set to a bipartite graph, uh, is, is one of the few that is well studied. Uh, and so, um, We've worked quite a bit on uh, attempting uh, to develop additional editing algorithms. And I'd like to talk about one of them for editing a graph to have bounded de degeneracy. Uh, degeneracy is basically the largest minimum degree of a subgraph. Um, it's a little bit easier to think about it in terms of vertex ordering. So here's our example of graph again, uh, and then the same graph reproduced, but now with the vertices ordered. and uh, and the degeneracy is just the maximum forward degree of any vertex. So what we see uh, is that we can sort of walk through the vertices in the graph. And only uh, each vertex only ever has two uh, edges going to the right, right? So it only ever has two forward edges, uh, even though there are several that have much larger degree. Um, and so we want to edit a graph to have some target degeneracy t. And the way that this works is we're going to mark the forward edges uh, of a vertex if its forward degree is too big. Um, so for our example graph, um, let's set the target equal to 1 because it's a gener degeneracy 2 graph, so there's not really a lot of room. Uh, and so almost every edge here gets marked. Uh, only two actually stay unmarked uh, here in the middle and, and at the end. And this is because uh, the, the two vertices that are their left endpoints are the only two vertices which have forward degree uh, only equal to 1. And so then the goal of the algorithm is to resolve all of the marks. So you want to get down to there being zero marks, because when there are no marks, then you know that the, that the edit set that you've deleted so far is, a, is, 
is, is a sort of feasible solution. Um, and the key observation, although it's maybe not fair to call it an observation, is that if the degeneracy of your original graph is t plus one, so your the problem is editing from degeneracy t plus one to degeneracy t, then uh, the sort of resolved functions or the resolved function, right, which is just the the difference in the number of marked edges after you've deleted some set of vertices, is actually um, submodular. And so this means that we can use a nice sort of greedy uh, submodular optimization algorithm uh, to get an approximation. Uh, so for this graph, the first step uh, is going to delete uh, this vertex of degree five here in the middle. And this actually resolves eight edges, um, five of which were uh, directly incident um, on the vertex itself. And then these other three uh, are also resolved because their left endpoint um, now only has forward degree one. And so they won't be marked uh, in the next iteration of the algorithm. So basically, the way the algorithm works is it uh, computes how many um, how many uh, edges are resolved by each deletion, picks the one with the biggest, and then recomputes an order and carries on. And there are some nice theorems uh, about this. Uh, but basically, the, the takeaway is that there is a greedy log approximation. Uh, and with a complementary hardness result, uh, which says that it's a little o of log n over t hard to edit to tree with t, we actually are reasonably confident that this is um, pretty tight. I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of wiggle room in there, um, but not too much. And that's all I have. That's great. This is right on time. And I learned a nice new technique for presenting theorems. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so that's great. So any questions uh, for Brian? Well, I guess Vivek, I, I think we are a little bit over time. So uh, so feel free to step out if you have other things to do, but uh, but it's nice to see what Vivek has to say, I guess. So if you are not hard pressed, please stick around. So uh, yeah, so it can be a good. five minute if you have <laughs> yeah, like present five something. <laughs> so I will try to keep short and I will just try to present the basic idea and the problems which I'm looking at. Basically what basically we are looking at and why we are looking at. So that's the main motive behind this talk. <clears throat> so I will present one work which I did, which will give you a brief introduction about what I'm doing. So is my slide visible? Just want to confirm. Hello. Yes, it is. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> so what I'm looking right now interested in is in tables and, and semi-structured data. So I'm Vivek. I'm a third year student uh, working with Vivek Shikumar. Uh, I work in NLP. So the main goal which I'm right now looking at is like working on semi-structured data. So there's lots of NLP work, which is around uh, normal text or unstructured text, which you read in paper, newspaper, even Wikipedia pages, but people haven't exploited much how tables can be used by machine learning. And some may think like it's a very trivial structure, but table is not that trivial. It has some semi-structured or structured data involved in it. So my main focus of like PhD is somehow trying to understand what is tables and how existing model work on it. So one uh, task which I would like to discuss is one tabular natural language inference, which is <coughs> uh, briefly, I will tell you this problem is about you are given a piece of information. Now, normally this piece of information is a sentence and then you are given another information hypothesis and you have to decide whether the hypothesis is true, false or cannot be determined. This is something like fact finding kind of thing also. And this is used for many tasks and it's shown that many other tasks can be reduced to this. So basically, you have to say basically yes, no kind of thing, whether given a information, uh, there's, a, there's a statement whether it's true or false. Now, what we look at differently from the other papers and this is like if this information which is present is a premise is our info boxes, which are tables. So I will give you an example in the next slide. For example, like there's a table which is given in the right, which is actually taken from a Wikipedia and clean out. So <clears throat> in this case, you are given about something called dressage, and this is the table which is there. Now, if I ask you a question, both men and women compete in the sport of dressage. So probably you will say yes. Now, 
answering this question require few things first of all you need to understand what is dressage and how do you understand even if you don't know exactly about the sports you can see there's lots of sports related term which is there in the table so you have to understand first it's a sport and then it says both men and women so there is somewhere in the information should be there whether both men and women cannot play and if you see in the table there is something called mixed gender and there is a boolean yes in front of it so now from this row i can determine that this information is true similarly i can write another sentence the same dressage athlete can participate in both individual and team events now again in the same table there is a information which is given like both individual and team at international level that means this statement look true but if you look there is a subtle thing in the sentence which is there which is the same dressage athlete now the same dressage athlete cannot be confirmed with this table so this is a neutral statement because there may be individual and team events which are there but can a same person participate in both for example somebody can uh, participate in a relay race as well as like 100 meter so this is not clear from this sports there is something like fei govern dressage only in the us now this information if you look at the table is false because there are two evidence is strongly suggest first of all the fei is international federation generally if a common sense is there that international is used for a body which govern everything okay and you also see that the sports is played all wide country wide so there is country or religion which is worldwide so the task which i introduce is something like you are given a table which is like a key value pairs uh, <coughs> which is taken from wikipedia or any other source and now you are given statements which are basically you have to verify whether they are true false or cannot be determined so this is the whole idea and there were no data set around it so first we created our own data sets and there is some reason why these are important i don't want to go in detail but the main idea is like as you can see this task is very tougher than the task of doing on a single sentence because it require you to compose information from multiple types of inferences so you have to use two rows three rows there's missing thing for example you can see mixed gender there was a yes so you have to understand what is mixed gender and what is yes in front of it mean also you have to combine information and world knowledge to derive to a information so for example both men and women compete in the sport of dressage the we have to understand what is the meaning of mixed gender and you have to also look at the table and find that it's a sports so this make the problem complex than a simple <coughs> sentence based thing there are other data sets also which are around table but they are more like database kind of thing where there is like a header kind of thing and there are similar rows kind of thing those have other kind of issues they have more information about like how do you do aggregation how do you find maximum and all numeric kind of thing uh, or search kind of thing but what we are mostly looking at in the like these are the ent entities which are there which we look at like competitiveness superlative aggregation aggregation and all in our case what we look at is basically let me skip all this thing because in the interest of time is something like <coughs> uh, these kind of reasoning where how can you do co reference with something or common sense is there is there a entity type in this table entity type is like this table is about a sports uh, numerical is like numerical thing is there a negation somewhere is a boolean thing uh, so we basically classify these kind of reasonings which are there in the table and which you need to understand to actually get to the table so we also develop some of our own reasoning like multiple row reasoning like and if you want to have simple look up then what is the kind of thing so uh, and we found that this data set which we made has lots of these reasonings uh, we manually annotated a partial of this partial subset of data and see how reasonings are there in these data set so there is knowledge and common sense core f and <coughs> lots of reasonings are there in each kind of thing and you also find some interesting pattern like some of the reasonings are more prominent in one kind of label for example neutrals are written when you use subjective or out of table information so which is reflected in these kind of reasoning annotation which you did and uh, so this was the main we also analyze how this data set is biased towards spurious patterns and other th things which i don't want to go in detail and let's now look at some of this thing we check first of all the biases which are there in the data set which is basically when i just remove the premise and just have the hypothesis and try to predict a label i know this is not the actual task which we are looking for but a model can always look at this in uh, like ways of getting the answer so you find that the data set has some bias and these are the real baseline which you should use 
so for example if you just train on a hypothesis model and try to predict or you swap premises and then try to predict and we also find that these biases and uh, so one interesting thing which we did in this data set is basically we have multiple test sets so it's varying level of difficulty so development and alpha 1 are the similar to the training set which we have but alpha 2 and alpha 3 are like contrast or adversarial sets and alpha 3 is mostly about a uh, cross domain or out <coughs> different domain test sets and we check that if you have these adversarial set these annotation artifacts are affected a lot and <clears throat> we get worse performance with these and all this i'm using state of art like nlp models which is like roberta and transformer based uh, one interesting challenge which is there in this is how do you represent data so there is was no explicit approach of representing a table text you can always tokenize things and then feed it to a bird or get a embedding and do it so we, we devised some methods like you can convert each table into a paragraph by converting each row into a uh, into a sentence for example this the equipment of dressage or horse comma appropriate horse right you can also ignore the paragraph and just uh, try to convert them into a structure kind of thing which is like just put key value pairs kind of thing the other is you can go something like intermediary where you basically convert them to a paragraph but the paragraph can be huge so you prune information out of this given the hypothesis so you as you can see in the example which i showed like not all the rows are used basically to answer a given question and somehow if i can look at the input more closely the hypothesis and the table i can prune some information out and just use that information which is much more closer to a sentence because current state of art nlp models are more sentence oriented they cannot go beyond 512 tokens so this is and tables can be as huge as you want so we test performance with some existing baselines uh, so obviously on adversarial set the performance was not good uh, these are the baseline the dotted dash lines which are the hypothesis bias baselines because we think like they are real baseline rather than the random baseline which like 33% which people form because these are the, the biases which are there in the data which our model can employ we we find that when you train on the full premise the model start learning few things like it started performing better Uh, it has slight improvement when you give structure information to it but it's still far away from the human accuracy point of view <clears throat> so uh, we also compare like the reasoning wise how these models are doing and we find that humans are doing pretty good there are some reasoning which are very easy to do like for example subjective out of table uh, finding neutrals is much much easier because you just need to see whether the information is there on the table or not but finding contrastive or contradiction is harder than finding entailment and this is something if you do in the real life finding a false statement is harder than finding a true statement this will you will observe if you try to basically do some fact verification kind of thing also <laughs> so uh, so overall we have this data set and all and overall what we are looking in larger picture is uh we have this table and some task around it which can be question answering nli or overall it's a reasoning over tables so one is how do you do that how do you handle the big how do you handle the structure how do you encode the structure of the table when you use it with nlp model how do you do reasoning over this how do you embed extra knowledge which is there for example in many of these you have to know like what is mixed gender so maybe the model automatically learn that in a parameter if not how can we inject this so we are looking some interesting questions about this ta tabular reasoning so which is about like table and it has lots of real life application i just want to give few real life application to motivate people if they want to work on something like this is for example you see tables everywhere for example even the talk announcement uh, or the people presenting is a table which is a key value pair with speaker name and the title uh, sometimes there is a abstract also so abstract and followed by abstract so tables are occurring everywhere you see tables in indexes of books you see tables in uh, shoppings <laughs> like every time if you go to a back of any product you can see tables of manufacturing date expiration date and if we can basically have machine models to do many of these things maybe we can aut automate lots of things which are right now not automated you can also verify claims uh, using tables and not and so i feel like tables are not that much utilized in a proper sense so we are trying to bridge this gap by building technology around it so this is like a very high level talk for new grads around what we are trying to do with in our nlp uh, in my work cool yeah, that's, that's very nice 
Yeah, since you're the last speaker, you can get to, and you are the host, you get to go on as long as you want. But uh, but in but if people have questions, this is maybe a good time. Yeah.